Welcome everyone. I'm Anna Gsumabusa. I'm the director of the Europe Center here at Stanford University. And we're delighted to welcome Jean Beeman today. Um, she's an associate professor of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and has held fellowships at both Duke and the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Her research focuses on race and ethnicity, racism, international migration, and state-sponsored violence in both France and in the United States. She's the author of the prize-winning Citizen Outsider, Children of North Af African Immigrants in France, as well as numerous articles and book chapters. And her current book project is on suspect citizenship and belonging, anti-racist mobilization, and activism against police violence in France, issues that are obviously very relevant um, for our life here in the United States as well. And so today, please join me in welcoming Professor Beeman as she presents on suspect citizenship, race and racism in post-colonial France. Welcome, Jean. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Anna, for this uh, really kind invitation and to the Europe Center. Um, and thank you all for being here after more than a year of um, lots of Zoom meetings and undoubtedly uh, Zoom fatigue. So hopefully you can see my screen okay. So just uh, give me a wave, Anna, if that's not the case as I go on, because I have this like ongoing paranoia about these things. Um, okay. Okay, so um, the title of my talk is Suspect Citizenship, Race and Racism in Post-Colonial France, and I'll go ahead and dive in. Um, so what I thought I would do is talk briefly about uh, my first book, Citizen Outsider, Children of North African Immigrants in France, and then discuss my ongoing ethnographic work on the construction of a suspect citizenship in France, and then I look forward to your, to your questions. So um, the main question of my research agenda is the following. How do citizens remain on the margins of mainstream society and what does this reveal for how race and ethnicity operate in practice? So as I'm an ethnographer, I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna center the lives and experiences of my respondents and I'm gonna start with the example of Safia, a 39 year old journalist and novelist who I first met about a decade ago. Uh, Safia is a 39-year-old journalist and novelist who I first met over a decade ago. Okay, so one morning she was describing her experiences growing up in France to Tunisian immigrant parents. She, described, she recalled the discrimination and mistreatment her parents experienced because of their immigrant status, lack of educational attainment, and illiteracy. She says, quote, I remember working really hard in school because I really wanted to escape my social background. I didn't want to be as poor as my parents or mistreated because when you don't know French perfectly well or have a certain level of education, especially when you're an immigrant, that's what happens. So I said to myself that when I grow up, it's out of the question to be treated like that. And I also worked hard because I wanted to earn a lot of money to help my parents, to help my parents be proud of me. So it was a bit of social retaliation there. Okay, so this, these feelings that I mentioned in the previous slide only intensified as she grew older. As a law student, she remembers classmates calling her a quote unquote dirty Arab and telling her she should return to her country. However, she managed to be successful in her studies, earning both undergraduate and graduate degrees. Safia now works as a journalist and rents an apartment in Sergi Pontoise, a Western banlieue or suburb with her two young children and her husband who was born to Algerian immigrant parents and works as a banker. There is much that makes her proud to be French, such as the values exemplified in liberté, egalité, fraternity. But she hates that her identity as a French person is often questioned by others. She says, quote, today when I'm with my children, people still ask me, what are your children's origins or where do you come from? That drives me crazy because my children were born in France to French parents. And me, I was born here. My children were born here and they still ask me that. It is so annoying to have to continually justify myself based on the color of my skin or the color of my children's skin, end quote. So Safia feels that her place in France is, is challenged because she is North African or Maghreban origin. Reflecting on her status in French society, she feels that she is quote unquote French in the second degree. Despite her middle-class status and educational and professional accomplishments, she nonetheless feels that she occupies a France that continually reminds her of how her ethnic origin excludes her from being accepted as French as anyone else. So in a later conversation, she recounted a disturbing incident. So one day she was traveling to Marseille in the south of France 
by train for some work-related meetings. She had no luggage with her since she was not spending the night and had only her work bag or satchel with her. When her train arrived back in Paris at Gare de Lyon at the end of the day, she was stopped leaving the train by a plainclothes police officer. He demanded to see what was inside her bag. She explained that he tutuated her or addressed her using the informal two form versus the formal vu form. Safia was offended that he did not immediately identify himself as a police officer, nor use the formal vu form when addressing her. He demanded to see her identification and asked her why she had only a work bag with her. Are you smuggling drugs? The officer asked. Are you a prostitute working for someone? Humiliated, Safia explained that she was a journalist who went to Marseille for some work-related meetings and showed her both her personal identification and the identification issuing the, for the publication for which she works. The craziest thing she explained to me as her eyes welled up with tears was that the train was packed with people, with white people. There were a ton of white people and I was the one stopped and no one said anything. The other passengers just stared at me, end quote. So Sophia explained to me that she has seen this happen to far too many racial and ethnic minorities in France. You can't, just let, you can't just let these things go by, she said. How can people not think this is wrong? And this photo is, that hopefully you can see, I just found two national magazine covers with headlines related to French national identity and sort of just a general question of what it means to be French. So Sophia is one of the adult children of North African immigrants. I discuss in my book, Pictured Here, Citizen Outsider, which was published in 2017. So based on ethnographic research and interviews with 45 middle-class adult children of Maghreban or North African immigrants, I discussed the intersections of race, ethnicity, and societal belonging in French society. I focus on the middle-class segment of the second generation population and demonstrate how they, how they are denied cultural citizenship, which would allow them to be accepted as French by others solely because they're not white. I frame this population as citizen outsiders, since the title, a term I borrow from political scientist Kathy Cohen, who uses it to characterize the precarious social locations of Black American youth. This is a framework that's rooted in work by scholars, including Du Bois, Panol, and Patricia Hill Collins, who have all conceptualized how individuals can be members of a society, yet simultaneously kept on the margins of that society, thereby complicating the relationship between race, citizenship, and national belonging. So the middle class North African second generation is both inside and outside of society. They have made it, so to speak, but only to a point as they are continually reminded of how their citizenship and belonging are quote unquote suspect and often questioned by others. These citizen outsiders are suspect at both micro and macro levels from having their identity routinely checked by the police in public spaces, like making Tolly Dolcite, such as what Safia experienced on that train, to growing up with few representations of North African or Maghreban origin individuals in government or popular culture. So to clarify terms um, and basically following the lead of my respondents, I use the term white throughout this talk to refer to Francais du Souche or those of native French European origin, even though I recognize that white is not an officially used term in French society, yet it is a term that's used by my, by my interlocutors. Also, just as my respondents are citizen outsiders, I too, as a non-French American citizen doing research in France was an outsider. And in some ways, my identity as a black American woman created an insider connection with my respondents because they also perceived me as a racial and ethnic minority. So my own race and identity <coughs> me, were and, therefore, and, and are therefore directly implicated in conducting this work. To me, this further reveals how race manifests itself in French society through the various connections that my interlocutors make. So why France? Um, so France is a really fascinating site for an analysis of these questions because of its continued disavowal of race and ethnicity as exemplified in the French Republican ideology. So French Republicanism emphasizes the relationship between individuals and the state over any other group categorization or identity. Being French is supposed to supersede any other identification, linguistic, religious, or otherwise. 
Race is not considered a legitimate category by the state. It is not measured in the French census. France therefore continually imagines and constructs itself as colorblind or race neutral. Yet despite the Republican emphasis on the renunciation of racial and ethnic categorization, France Fanon, as well as many scholars of French colonial history, have argued that France has long relied on racial and ethnic boundaries in constructed its national identity. Since France has a long history of colonial slavery, colonial rule, and related subsequent migration to the metropole, it is necessary to understand how individuals who are descendants of these structures bear in contemporary French society. So I use the framework of cultural citizenship as a corrective to theories of immigrant incorporation and assimilation for the second generation. Cultural citizenship signifies a claim to belonging that is accepted by others that would allow an individual to traverse the cultural symbolic boundaries around a particular national identity, or in this case, enable these children of North African immigrants to be seen as truly French by others. So cultural citizenship is particularly interesting in France as citizenship is something that is supposed to supersede all markers of difference. My approach to cultural citizenship is informed by, among others, legal scholar, legal scholar Letty Volp, who has emphasized how citizenship is automatically constituted by specific cultural values, and anthropologist Renato Rosaldo, who conceives of cultural citizenship as a right to be different without being denied belonging. This approach challenges notions of citizenship as the salient boundary marking us versus them, as articulated by the work of Brubaker, Lamont, and others. I push this further here by demonstrating how the North African second generation is excluded despite their legal citizenship status. Citizenship status is therefore not a significant marker of inclusion and exclusion as children of immigrants here experience marginalization similar to that of their immigrant parents solely because they are not white. So my interlocutors are technically part of France but continually kept on the margins of French society. This exclusion cannot be explained by their socioeconomic status as they are middle class, well-educated and hold professional kinds of jobs, as well as, they, as well as are upperly mobile compared to their immigrant parents. Rather, they are incapable of being seen as French by others because of their ethnic origins or because they're not white. So though France promotes an inclusionary national identity through its Republican model, it in fact excludes certain populations despite their citizenship, such as the children of immigrants from former French colonies in the Maghreb. France therefore has a growing group of citizens who despite doing everything quote unquote right, cannot be ever seen as complete, uh, as complete French citizens by their compatriots. So France's colorblind ideology Uh, bails the difficulties facing marginalized individuals solely because of their race and ethnic origin. Here I'm influenced by Sans Fanon, who in Black Skin White Mass wrote eloquently of how the European has a fixed concept of the Negro, and therefore how Blacks in France are not seen as of France. I extend Ami and Wynon's framework of the racial project to the French context here. This framework allows me to consider how people are marked as different and inferior without state level categories. It also explains the creation and maintenance of a quote unquote racial common sense in which individuals are marked as distinct in the absence of state categories and these distinctions may come to have meaningful consequences. I'm also influenced by the work of French scholar Patnandier who's discussed how blacks in France are paradoxically and simultaneously visible and invisible and Chika Keaton who has argued how France's race blindness is coupled with race-based assumptions, which therefore lead to a consciousness of race. I'm also influenced by the work of David Field Goldberg in this framework of racial Europeanization, or how race is seen as a problem everywhere but in Europe, where it, often, where it is often instead framed as exceptional or related to phenomena of the past, such as the Holocaust. He argues that, quote, the idea of the European excludes those historically categorized as non-European, as not being white, as being non-white, excuse me. You are here, but don't really or fully belong. Your sojourn is temporary. They'll get you comfortable, end quote. Racial Europeanization also illustrates 
how race and ethnicity can be taboo to discuss or invoke. Here's my research and that of many others shows omnipresent in the lives of individuals marked as non-white. Racial meanings are articulated and hierarchies based on those meanings are still applied. So I want to now provide some examples of this denial of cultural citizenship in my data. So Farid, who is a 29-year-old of Moroccan origin, who lives with his family in the Western Banyu of Plassi, feels that his ethnic origin has colored his experiences, including his, ex his career working at a bank. He remembers one of his colleagues suggesting he change his name to one that is more traditionally French, like Pierre or Jacques. Here he was encouraged to hide one marker of his difference, his North African sounding name, in order to fit in. He says, quote, they don't want me. They tell me to integrate. Me, I don't want to integrate. I am French. I don't need to integrate. I was born in France. I respect the laws of the Republic. But they still tell us, no, you are not French. You will never be French. They tell us that because our parents have foreign origins and that automatically we be true. We are sometimes obligated to hide our differences as if we are ashamed of them. But I've arrived at an age when I tell myself it's my difference. I'm not looking to put it out front, but I don't want people to tell me to hide it, end quote. So here for our references, what many of my respondents reference uh, in my book, the impossibility of being seen as a full French citizen by others. Nasser, a 29-year-old of Algerian origin and a practicing Muslim who lives in Nanterre, which is a Western banlieue of Paris, says, quote, we are sitting between two chairs. Even though I'm a manager at my company, I drive an expensive car, et cetera. I can try to go to a club, like a nightclub or something, and cannot get in. And then I return to reality. You are never 100% either way. Maybe I'm asking for too much, wanting to be both 100% Algerian, excuse me, and 100% French, but I can't choose between them. I want to combine the best parts of both into something great, but I don't know, I still feel different, end quote. So Nasser is university educated. He did his undergraduate work in France and his university studies in the UK, and has worked at his company as both an engineer and a technical director. Because of his professional and educational accomplishments, he feels as though he understands the codes or sense of behaviors necessary for success in the French workplace and larger French society. However, Nasser realizes that his professional success and the cultural capital that comes with it are not enough to prevent him from the same discrimination and mistreatment that less quote unquote successful children of Maghreban immigrants or immigrants themselves experience. Despite his upward mobility vis-a-vis -vis his own immigrant parents, his father worked in construction and his mother was a homemaker and neither of them had greater than the equivalent of an elementary school level education. Nasser does it feels he is not removed from occupying a marginal status in larger French society. He says, quote, if I'm walking in the bourgeois Parisian neighborhood and an old French lady sees me, she'll cross the street to walk on the other side. I think it's going to take several more generations for people to not see differences like this for someone to see a black person or an Arab walk by in the street and not even notice it. So with this research, I later rest the notion of a French exceptionalism regarding distinctions based on race and ethnicity. The examples of these citizen outsiders reveal how non-white individuals do not get to be seen as French in the sense of having that identity as French accepted by others. They lack the cultural citizenship to actually be accepted by French, so such as French, excuse me. This illustrates France's racial project, which creates a racial common sense in a seemingly colorblind society. By focusing on middle-class individuals, I demonstrate how being incorporated into French society and being accepted as others is not a question of various professional or educational accomplishments. This reveals how race and ethnicity operate as master categories shaping, among other things, boundaries of inclusion and exclusion. In other words, race matters because Maghreb and origin individuals and other minorities are racialized. Race and ethnicity are not legitimated by the state because of its Republican ideology, yet nonetheless become evident through everyday practices of marginalization and exclusion. Because of this racial formation, 
non-white immigrant origin individuals will continually be left out of mainstream society and only a partial assimilation would ever be possible. Even though my respondents exemplify what immigrants and their descendants are supposed to do to quote unquote fit in, such as work hard, be well-educated, hold stable middle-class jobs, what is clear here is that it is never enough. This is a reality not only for middle-class children of North African immigrants, but for non-white individuals in France today. So my current ethnographic work, you know, outside of the global pandemic, um, is building on, off of these questions to consider how a suspect citizenship or belonging is continually constructed in contemporary French society. So I'm currently conducting ethnographic research on mobilization against police violence or state violence against Black and Maghreban ordinary individuals, which so far has been included in interviews with activists who are associated with different collectives or organizations as well as journalists who reported on some of these issues and family members of victims of police violence themselves, some of whom have then become activists. I am using anti-racist mobilization and activism against police violence and harassment to examine how state violence is one of the mechanisms that is reinforcing a second class, a second class citizenship or suspect citizenship for these minority populations. In their activism, these minority populations are responding to a violence that is not new, but rather an extension of the violence under France's colonial rule. In this way, the ongoing racial logics of difference forged under colonialism provide a context for the use of state violence and police harassment and enforcing boundaries of belonging and non-belonging. Despite the multitude of distinctions among France's uh, visible minorities, and, and of course the, the ways that French Republican ideology downplays identity-based communities, state violence and a grow, growing mobilization against it suggests that a collective quote-unquote we is forming. State violence and instantiating boundaries also illustrates how citizenship and societal belonging extends beyond questions of having legal, legal citizenship status. State violence or the threat thereof reminds them of their continual second class status in society. I argue that we have to understand racism in post-colonial France and more broadly, that there's a construction of an ongoing suspicion. And I use visible minorities experiences with state violence and how they mobilize against it to understand how this is constructed. In doing so, I built upon existing work on second-class citizenship and the boundaries of societal inclusion and exclusion. Here I'm in conversation with Akim Ambe's notion of necropolitics, considering the ways that the state has the capacity to determine who is and who is not disposable, or moreover, who does and who can, and who can belong or not belong, as well as Anna Kornobag and Gorky Yerdel's production of non-belonging, Mira Yerl Davis's notion of the politics of belonging, Paul Silverstein's conception of citizen, citizenship surveillance through Le Quintoy Identité of predominantly Black and Maghreban origin individuals, and Damani Patrick's work on the construction of non citizens and reunified post 1989 Germany, and how they are suspects to quote unquote exclusionary incorporation. I'm interested in the ways that people are continually kept on the margins of society and how they mobilize against that and use state violence and anti-racist mobilization as a way to think through that. So this relationship between suspect citizenship and state violence can be seen, for example, in the 2005 uprising throughout many of France's banlieues or suburbs. Here, Saïd Bena, a 17-year-old of Tunisian origin, and Bena Traoré, a 16-year-old of Malayan origin, pictured here were electrocuted in a substation as they fled police at Clichy Chubois, a Parisian banlieue. They are apparently trying to avoid the, con the constant condole d'identité or identity check by the police. So outrage about their death led to uprisings throughout France, which lasted a few weeks. Then President Jacques Chirac declared a state of emergency. And then interior minister and later president, Nicolas Sarkozy, called the individuals involved in the uprising Rakai or scum and suggested cleaning the streets of the banyo with a crosshair, a brand of a high pressure water hose. 
So the police officers involved in the deaths of Zaid and Bana were cleared of all, the, of all charges over a decade later. So these events at the time drew national and international media attention to an often ignored segment of the French population, immigrants and descendants of immigrants from former French colonies throughout Africa. These uprisings were also covered in the American and other international media, depicted as a quote unquote, other France, bemoaning how France is a public and ideology, which does not acknowledge race and ethnicity as legitimate categories, has failed to fully incorporate its immigrants and minorities and address or recognize its colonial legacy in parts of Africa and elsewhere. And also what was missed in much of this coverage was how these uprisings were started as a, as a, due to an incident of state violence. And this image on my top right is of minority protesters with signs saying, you know, we taking, saying we are scum or sort of reclaiming or taking back uh, this term from, from Sarkozy. <clears throat> a more recent example is the case of Adama Trawe, a 24-year-old black construction worker who died under unusual circumstances after being arrested in a banyu north of Paris in July 2016. So the police first claimed that he had died of a heart attack and then said he had a, then later said he had a severe infection. So Asa Trawe, pictured here under a photo of her brother, is his 32-year-old sister who is leading the movement for justice for Adama. Since his death, which one American media account termed quote unquote Francis Ferguson, there have been numerous demonstrations demanding justice for Adama Traoré, including one every year on the anniversary of his death. And this photo is from once one such demonstration in, in 2018. So also and her family are alleging lack of assistance and willful neglect by the police as both contributing to his death, especially, he had, especially as he had no chronic health conditions prior to his death. Before her death, she was working as a teacher's assistant in another banyo north of Paris. She has since written two books, the sales of which she uses to seek justice for her brother. This includes paying legal fees for four of her other brothers, she has 17 total siblings, who have been in jail for various periods of Adama's death. She has stated publicly that her family has been under attack by the state ever since they contested the official explanation for Adama's death. So Asa regularly gives talks about state violence and her brother's death, not just in France, but all over the world, and has received support from various celebrities, including French rapper Maccabi and activist and scholar Angela Davis. As she explained to me when we first met back in 2017, she sees this cause as not just about justice for her brother, but for all forgotten populations in France, including residents of the Quartier Populaire or working class neighborhoods, who know the police only as a quote unquote invading force. Once when I met with her when she was signing copies of her first book at the offices of Seoul, her publisher in Paris, she explained, quote, we don't see people like Adama as a human, a son, a brother. Even I've been controlled in these Cartier neighborhoods. What's happening is France is having an identity crisis. It wants to suppress differences, but you can't do that, end quote. Asa's point is also interesting for thinking through the tensions inherent in French Republican society, as some differences in French society are seen as meaningful and others are not. And this photo here is um, from a demonstration I was a part of in 2017. Another example we can point to is follows the massacre at the editorial offices of Charlie Hebdo, a satirical magazine in January, 2015. In the aftermath of this massacre, a great deal of attention focused on the slain cartoonists and the columnists, including the international slogan, Je suis Charlie. But another slogan soon appeared, recognizing another victim of these attacks, Ahmed Marabe, pictured here. Marabe was a Muslim police officer of Algerian origin, killed during the attacks while trying to pursue the offices, the, excuse me, pursue the shooters at the offices of Charlie Hebdo and the 11th arrondissement. It was Jussie Charlie, however, that became the international rallying cry. Jussie Ahmed was a far less common sentiment. The central question about inclusion and belonging and who is and who can be an emblematic citizen upholding the core values of French society 
hangs in the gap between these two slogans. In other words, can someone who is seen as not French, as not white, ever be the poster child for freedom, tolerance, and democracy in contemporary France and Europe more generally? I also like this quote by Aurea Bochara, a French activist of Algerian origin who started the group and political party, Parti de l'Egyne de la République. She says, quote, it only takes one generation for an Italian, a Portuguese, or a Pole to become really French, while this dignity will always in effect be denied to the old departed Africans who remain relegated to the hexagon in the dusty corners of the empire. As for the metropolis, it parked them out of reservations with their children, to Arab to be French, to indigenous to be white. Between white people and us, there is race. It is constitutive of this republic. It will always rise between us, end quote. So to me, this exemplifies how race continually structures the nation state, even in the post-colonial era, or rather, as Horia herself has referred to it, the quote unquote neo-colonial reality. This is another way of thinking through the panic of the post-colonial. France's current anxieties around immigrants, multiculturalism, or Islam need to be properly situated within this colonial history, specifically in the Maghreb, West Africa, and parts of Asia and the Caribbean. They should hopefully move us beyond a, a solely immigrant focused lens to grappling with how actual citizens are marginalized across Europe because of their race and ethnic origin. Despite France's Republican ideology, which again denies race as being salient, it nonetheless structures boundaries of inclusion. But also, this uh, inclusion, excuse me, but this also, this quote gets at how race and racism structure who can actually belong and whose belonging or societal membership will always be seen as suspect. Of course, we can and should consider these questions outside of France. Consider the juxtaposition of images of Alain Kurji, the three-year-old ground Syrian refugee found on the shore of Turkey trying to reach Greece in 2015 with a Charlie Hebdo cartoon depicting two men chasing, two, chasing a terrified woman with the caption, what would little Elan have grown up to be? And then answered on the bottom by an ask roper in Germany. Or the multiple examples of black Americans who've been killed by the police just in the past 12 months pictured here and the growing Black Lives Matter movement, which is challenging among other things how Black Americans are never seen as fully American and as already reverberating a connection to global movements against racism and state violence, including in France, which I'm happy to talk more about in the Q&A. In that sense, we should consider suspect citizenship as a clarion call for all marginalized populations globally, especially those populations racialized as less. Thank you. Wonderful, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to stop sharing because I'm terrified of this thing. So. <laughs> um, and I'd invite the audience uh, to please submit their questions in the Q&A. I'm going to uh, take the prerogative of the moderator and ask the first question, um, which is going to be a very political science-y one. So anyway, because um, citizenship implies a state that grants citizenship. Not just that, but a whole, a whole ideological project about what citizenship consists of, what um, you know, what it looks like, and so on. And in France, you know, as we're as we're very familiar with, there's sort of this Republican idea of civic nationalism and a deliberate erasure of race and ethnicity. Those are questions that can't even be asked um, officially. And I'm wondering, you know, in what ways does that contribute to this second class uh, citizenship, to sort of you know this om omission basically of cultural citizenship um, in France? So I, yeah, so thanks for the question, but I, I, I'm not sure I fully, so you're asking me sort of how does this sort of particular structure of legal citizenship in France like relate to cultural citizenship or something else? It basically, you know, this, both sort of, you know, the legal citizenship and sort of the whole official ideology that there's no such thing as race or ethnicity, we are all French, you know, we are all Gauls um, and, and, and so on. How does that sort of help to create the space for this kind of uh, second class citizenship? 
Oh, yes. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So yeah, I think it helps to create the space for the second class citizenship because it, it makes it so that it's impossible for people who are not white to ever be seen as French, right? And so like the sort of official discourse or their official understanding is that they should just be seen as French. And sort of interestingly, um, in my research, you know, many of my respondents do see themselves as French, but then the, the question then becomes they're not seen as French by fellow citizens, but then of course there's no language within the understanding of French citizenship to even to talk about that or invoke that or explicate that. So I think the sort of um, intense colorblind ethos of French citizenship or what it means to be French, the definition of French creates a space for there to actually be very uh, much differentiation and marginalization of people who aren't seen as white in French society. Right. And it presumably also calls for her translation effort, right? Right. Well, Those who yeah. want to advocate, yeah. Um, yeah. So we have a wonderful question from uh, Sunita Moss, who uh, pays you the, the wonderful compliment of saying that her dissertation is heavily influenced by your work. And she Thank asked you. about um, the representation of uh, Black Lives Matter as a, or as a Black issue, as an American issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the extent to which basically there might be some kind of an alliance that forms between uh, BLM activists in the United States and the French activists. What are sort of you know, the different tensions between them? Um, mm -hmm and especially between US Black Americans who live in France, mm -hmm. basically Black mm -hmm. expats. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thanks so much for the compliment and thank you for the really thorough question. So this is something I'm trying to, I'm hoping to sort of explicate more in this growing second book project. And so a couple of thoughts on this. So one, um, I got interested in this issue of police violence or state violence in France to learning about the death of Adama Traoré. And the way that I learned about it actually was in the New York Times, kind of, I think somewhat oddly, and the headline was something to be, it was like one of the editorial board uh, pieces. And the headline was something to the effect of, you know, Black Lives Matter in France too. And so that got me really, really curious about like what that even means. And I happened to be in France at the time that I, I read that article. And so I did a lot of, um, you know, connecting with people. I had been in contact with my dissertation and first book and sort of went down that rabbit hole. And that's sort of how I found, um, you know, one, this sort of growing anti-racist movement, but also around police violence, but also sort of learned a lot more about the sort of uh, scope of police violence and police harassment in various communities. And so what I quickly, um, one of the things that's come, that's come out of that research that I'm thinking through that's come out of that research is the ways in which, you know, activists in France, uh, anti-racist activists in France or people who are mobilizing against police violence are very much paying attention to and in conversation with what's happening here in the United States. And I would argue also what's happening, you know, with Black Lives Matter in Brazil or sort of other sort of anti-racist struggles in the UK or Germany or what have you. But they're also very, um, there's also this sort of very interesting tension between wanting to demonstrate that police violence is a global phenomenon, but they're also something that's very specific and particular to the French context. And so, um, they're not, you know, so for example, Asa, who's someone I've talked to, um, Asa Traway, who I mentioned in the talk, is someone I've talked to about specifically the US Black Lives Matter movement. And one of the things that she pulled out for me was this idea of sort of like, well, how can there, you know, how can African Americans have this movement for Black Lives Matter that is it's, it's still sort of separating them out from other Americans, right? So in other words, they're still interpreting Black Lives Matter through the lens of our US identity politics in which we have, you know, I mean, this is both their, this is their perception, not the reality, but that we have sort of African Americans over here and this group over there and that group over there, right? And and, the, and Black French people, uh, or Black people, Black activists in France want to just be seen as French, want to be seen as French as any other person. So how do you have a movement that separates out um, a whole a whole source, a whole uh, segment of the population? So that's one answer. The second answer also is sort of thinking through um, what is actually the project of Black Lives Matter as a social movement, both in the United States and globally, right? And so, you know, again, like the idea, the perception of some of the people I've interviewed uh, for this project is that Black Lives Matter um, is doing, is, um, uh, yeah, doing too much work to sort of separate themselves out from other Americans in a way that French activists are not invested in doing. However, um, one thing that's changed in the last, uh, I don't know, 12 months or so, especially since the death of George Floyd, is activists in France have seen how there, how there have been so many Black Lives Matter protests and demonstrations in the United States by non-Black people. And so that sort of says, oh, well, maybe there is something broader about this movement that's easier for us to sort of directly connect to. But I think there is a sort of tension, this is probably why I'm sort of really interested in this question um, instead of all 
won't go on for too long, but I'm really interested in this question because I think it's sort of like, how do you build a global solidarity while also getting people to recognize what's very local and particular to the French context? And how do you like, I mean, those are, those are things that are like inherently in conflict and how do you pay attention to both of those at once, right? Um, I think the other quick thing I'll say about to that question, um, it's, it's also really interesting to think through how activists are understanding the scope of police violence in France versus the United States as it relates to Black Lives Matter. So part of the thing is that, you know, maybe unsurprisingly, there's far more deaths by the police in the United States. So I've like been at many demonstrations in France where people will say something to the effect of, we need to address this issue now before we become like the United States, right? So it's also a sort of way in which like, you know, we can get sort of, um, we can use different repertoires or strategies um, from, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, as a sort of social movement strategy, but we also have to be careful to not make the problem as bad as it is in the United States, right? And so there's, it's like both things are happening um, simultaneously. And then I'll just quickly say, sorry, just, <laughs> just like a lot of this question. Um, i just quickly say, the other thing I'll say to this too is that I, I think it's also helpful to keep in mind um, the ways that this sort of global conversation around Black Lives Matter in this present moment is really in many ways just the latest manifestation of you know, global solidarities and movements for struggles for liberation for, for Black people, right? So for example, there's a lot of references to the US civil rights movement and some of these discussions I've been able to have. So I think Black Lives Matter, if you think about it in terms of just another stage and a long arc of social movements, it's sort of those connections I think make, make a bit more sense. But thank you for that really thorough question. So I think you know, your your talk is really stimulating us to think very broadly about the comparisons between the United States and France, and so sort of, you know how we conceive of race and ethnicity and citizenship in both countries. So there's another question, which is that you know that um, a lot of basic sort of calls to end French racism have been labeled and dismissed as just Americanization, right? Mm -hmm. So how is it in a society that sort of you know claims to be race blind? Do you engage with institutionalized racism without sort of you know being dismissed as just another American ideology? Yeah, thanks for that question. So I guess uh, the first thing I say is I'm often am dismissed <laughs> as another <laughs> as an annoying American. So I don't know if I have the sort of perfect solution to that. But I think what's really interesting, um, you know, so yeah, a lot of thoughts about this. Um, I think what's really interesting too is that when I first went to France to do this field work for my first book as a graduate student, I was like very conscious of like not imposing US-based frameworks to the French context. And so I like probably overly conscious. So I like never even brought up the term racism or race, I was really just trying to ask people about their experiences as it relates to their identity, however they identify, whatever that means to them, you know, politically or otherwise. But what quickly became apparent is that people would, you know, use the word racism and also make connections with their assumptions about my experiences as an African American with what they what they also have experienced. So they would tell stories about sort of being denied promotions at work or being overlooked for this opportunity or that opportunity and say something to the effect of, oh, well, you must know what that's like, like to me. And I would be like, oh, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> but like, you know, so if they're, and, and, then, and then they would sort of use those, those, those frameworks or those references that allowed me to see as a social scientist that they actually are, that they are understanding their experiences and, you know, their opportunities are less thereof in a racialized context, even though you can't use that language. So I think from a methodological standpoint or an ethnographic standpoint specifically, it was really fruitful for me to really engage with people on their own terms and then sort of build from that versus sort of asking people or coming to people with a particular kind of political stance or what have you. Um, so that's one thing. And that's also was another way that allowed me to kind of understand how, um, you know, children of North African immigrants understand their social locations. It's just partly through understanding the social or, or making connections with minorities around the world. So, you know, this is sort of, for example, one way that it, it was easy for me to understand, or became easier for me to understand how they relate to like, you know, the conflict in Palestine, for example, and how they see their solidarities there. And so these things became more apparent when they were bringing up these references um, that came up sort of organically in their conversation versus me sort of directly asking them. So that's one answer. The second thing I'll say to that, um, it's like, yeah, I, so that's sort of the eth ethnographic answer, but the sort of sociologist academic answer or presenting my work, like I think I often am dismissed as an American. Um, and so I, I um, you know, I don't really have a solution for that <laughs> beyond just to sort of like directly quote what French people are telling me. But I think this is something that you see happening in France more and more. And even like, you know, to go back to the example of Asa Traoré, who is France, who was French and is, you know, born and raised in France and talking about her own experiences, not just in terms of the death of her brother, but also just her own experiences with racism. She's often critiqued as being too influenced by, by Americans, right? So it's like, even for French people, they get this accusation when they bring this up. So in some ways it feels like, 
what I experience is like, you know, pales in comparison to what people like her are experiencing. So I, that's sort of a half answer to that, to that part of the question, but thank you for that. Thank you for the question. Wonderful. Um, there's another question about, you know, so I think what's striking about your talk is that the citizens you talk about want not just to be equal citizens, they also want to be considered French, right? Um, and so the question that arises is what about hyphenated identities? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to achieve first class citizenship in France and yet have a hyphenated identity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for, another, thanks for another really great question. So that was something I expected to see more of a discourse about when I was doing my fieldwork, primarily for my dissertation and first book, um, in the sense that I thought that there would be more of a explicit critique of French Republican ideology um, in a way that would sort of allow for these kinds of African-American-esque kinds of identities, right? But instead it was quite the opposite. Um, people, you know, not only want to just be seen as French and sort of only answer that they're, you know, so it's sort of this thing where like, you know, that we have in the United States of the perpetual foreigner syndrome where someone asks someone who's, you know, fourth generation Japanese, or where are you really from, right? And so it's like, obviously they're not, you know, they're not getting to a specific, you know, uh, uh, residential address. They're actually, you know, they're asking about some kind of origin, right? And it's a similar kind of thing uh, in France. And then my response would say, okay, well, if you're asking me like over and over again, I'll say that my parents are from Algeria, but I actually just wanted to say that I'm from Lyon or whatever part of France I'm from, right? And so there is a way in which their concerned um, or their political project is around sort of being seen like solely as French, just the way that any white French person could just say that they're French, right? And so the hyphenated identity uh, would imply a critique of French Rep Republican ideology as it is, and the critique instead is about how it's implemented. So in other words, um, you know, so just to get back, a bit, back to my experiences as an ethnographer, I would often get this question of sort of like, well, why do I identify, or I guess I would actually say identified as African-American versus just saying that I'm American? Like, what is the sort of utility of even identifying that way in the United States? Like, that doesn't make any sense to a lot of the people I was interviewing, because for them, it's like, well, you're telling me you were born and raised in the United States, you're a U.S. citizen. So what is the claim to this entire continent? Uh, which is, you know, it, yeah, like it was really interesting for a lot of reasons, but, you know, just to kind of, just to kind of double down the point, they're saying like, when you do that, you're separating yourself out from other Americans and we don't want to separate ourselves out. We want France to recognize, we want French Republican ideology to recognize that we're just as French as any other French person. And the actual model of, you know, individuals interacting with the state just as individuals or, you know, it versus the parts of an identity-based communities is actually the better, the best way to organize a plural society. So they're very much against any sort of, I mean, this is both like their perception uh, more than I think is actually the reality, but nonetheless, their perception of what, you know, U.S. identity politics are, that there are these kinds of balkanized, separated identity-based categories. They feel like that's not the best way to manage or create any kind of cohesion, cohesion, excuse me, in a plural society. So that's sort of where like the sort of the problem with plural and with hyphenated identities, excuse me, comes into play. I mean that, so just to, I kind of ramble for a second, but just to kind of really recap. So the point here is that like, you know, they they can assert those, but those are those are only, they only assert those when they have to because people refuse to believe they're actually French, but that's not actually what the goal should be basically. Mm -hmm. Um, so since we're moving into a more comparative framework, um, Al has a question here about Germany and Belgium, right? Are there sort of citizenship regimes and other states and other societies and how they deal with this issue of suspect citizenship? Um, I mean, you know, the Turkish minority in Germany is probably a second, you know, they weren't even allowed to be citizens until very recently. Mm -hmm. right, so how do right. those policies play out and how do those identities play out there? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I don't have a fully fleshed answer to that. I mean, the one thing I will, the one way I'm trying to think about this question um, is kind of less thinking about sort of who has a right to legal citizenship, but rather thinking about who has a right um, to sort of be seen as a citizen or be seen as fully belonging, right? So that's kind of where I think, why I think, or one of the reasons why I think the cultural citizenship framework is so helpful because it allows me to think through people like less of a question around sort of what are the actual um, policies around, you know, dictating who can legally belong, but rather like who's interpreted or read or visible as part of a particular society. So in that sense, um, there's a lot of co commonalities, I think, between um, the experience, the experiences, the lived experiences of, you know, second generation Turkish immigrants in, in Germany and second generation Algerian immigrants in France, even though the citizenship sort of regimes are very different or the sort of reasons for migration or 
somewhat different. Um, the actual sort of who can represent a particular society and who's seen as, as actually belonging are very similar. So that's kind of how I think, I mean, that's not a, a really great answer to your question, but that's sort of how I'm thinking about these, these, comparative, um, these comparative notions of citizenship through this sort of understanding of like societal belonging. And I think we have time for a final question um, that arose earlier, which is, yeah, so given how deeply ingrained these notions are that, you know, to be, if you're white, you're assumed to be French. And if you're second class, you know, second generation Portuguese, you're French. But that's not the case if you happen to be an ethnic or racial minority. So, and this isn't just a question of official state policies. It seems to be sort of you know, a societal, deeply held belief. So given that, and given some of the extent of racism in the United States or elsewhere, how do we overcome this? How do you, <laughs> how in any way can we sort of yeah. construe yeah. of each other as equal citizens? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's what, I mean, that's the, that's the million dollar question that um, if I had the direct answer for I'd have a million dollars. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, I, you know, I go back and forth between this sort of, um, you know, both in terms of based on my own research and then just being a sociologist and being interested in sort of comparative race and ethnicity, like I go back and forth to this question of like, how do we think through the best way to sort of organize or construct um, a, a plural society, you know, in which everyone's, it can be different no matter what, you know, across a variety of different domains, but there still is something meaningful to being American or being French or being German or whatever. Um, and I, you know, so part of, I, depending on my mood or whatever is going on I tend to think that like sometimes I'm like okay we need to have these separate racial like there's a value in having you know these separate racial categories codified by the state that we can therefore have you know data about and so one of the frustrations for me as a social scientist studying France is that there, that data just isn't available and it's just like anno you know and compared to what we have in the United States so it's just annoying on a sort of kind of practical scholarly level, right? And so I, but, you know, so I think that that does a particular work, but then the other part of me is like, um, you know, I, I've learned a lot over the years through engaging with my respondents and doing this ethnographic work to really, that's really forced me to grapple with, well, why do I need these categories so much? I mean, sort of like I was saying to the previous answer, you know, what is it, what, what does the category of African-American really do for me? And like, how does that, um, how does that make me feel more of an American or make me feel um, like I have a sense of belonging in the United States or, you know, how does, you know, so like what is so, you know, so in that sense, I'm sort of like, okay, so maybe we just do need to get rid of categories and just sort of, you know, treat individuals as individuals. But then of course, then you, you know, I think the example of France shows that does it actually really work in practice. So how do you sort of, you know, even if the Republican ideology or the general idea there is a sound one, it's not sort of implemented in a way that actually is effective. So how can we actually move towards making it effective, which is not like a great answer, but it's something I think about a lot because I think this is a tension. Like there's like, they're both societies that have very different, very long histories of migration and different kinds of regimes of colonial rule and different issues around, different both similar issues around racial exclusion. And they think about it in very different ways, but then there still are a lot of similarities among people and about racial minorities in both societies. So like, what does that really tell us for even like the, for even the, you know, what the state can actually do as it relates to these questions. Um, so that's, right. yeah, that's kind of, yeah, right. that's a great question. Thank you. Um, well, on that rather depressing note. Yeah, no, I, was say, I was trying to like think of a way to I know, there's, there's no way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for a fantastic talk, wonderful research findings and a great presentation um, and a fantastic discussion afterwards. Thank you so much. We really appreciate thank it. So um, thank I you for your time. for the technical issues that we're getting, but thank you so much everyone for coming. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. This is the last lecture of the uh, of the year. We'll see you in the fall. Take care. Bye bye.